All right, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so at Crit uh, TLDR, we implemented a new, not a new, we implemented a, a symmetric encryption scheme uh, called Intermag, and this is uh, why and how, and whether it's useful in practice. Uh, so this is our timeline for the next 25 minutes. Uh, I'll first go over some motivation, and then I will introduce you to Intermag Lib, and we will use Intermag Lib to implement um, a few Intermag-based OpenSSH cipher modes, and then measure their performance uh, uh, with respect to, or and compare the performance uh, to existing OpenSSH cipher modes. So I use cipher modes. Cipher mode is equivalent to a to a TLS cipher suit suite. All right, and then we're done. All right. So we all know that symmetric encryption is a hugely important tool for achieving, for example, confidentiality of data. But how do we how do we model security of a symmetric encryption scheme? AE or authenticated encryption has emerged as the de facto standard. Uh, that some extra encryption schemes should satisfy to be considered for practical deployment. But AE or other standard cryptographic security notions all have the same underlying assumption. They assume that the ciphertext, uh, when it's sent to Bob, arrives in its entirety. And we also assume that the entire ciphertext is available when decrypting. But is this a good approximation? In 2002, Belay, Kona, and Ampempe proved that CBC mode in SSH is secure. But then in 2009, Albeck, Patterson, and Watson uh, presented a plain text recovery attack against CBC mode. So this is kind of odd. Uh, so how did this happen? When data packets traverse networks or are being processed by applications, they're subject to fragmentation. So let's assume that Alice, oh, there's a cloud here, but it's not shown. So let's assume that Alice sends a ciphertext to Bob. This ciphertext might arrive uh, uh, to Bob fragmented. It's then Bob's task to decrypt uh, using the ciphertext fragments and somehow assemble the original plain text. So we'll call this ciphertext fragmentation. Uh, implementations must cater for this feature, and protocols like SSH contains a length field in the packets uh, to assist the, the receiver in decrypting. And it's the presence of cybertext fragmentation that allowed Albeck, Patterson, and Watson to mount an attack against CBC mode. On the other hand, it was the lack of, cybertext, of catering for cybertext fragmentation in the model of Belay, Kuna, and Pemper that made it possible for them to prove that CBC mode was secure. Luckily, there is a, exists a framework where you can study some extra encryption schemes uh, in the presence of cybertext fragmentation. And this was first presented by Boldoriva, Degabielli, and Patterson, and Stam in 2012. I won't go into the technical details about this framework, but instead I'll give you a short tour of the security notions you can define in it. So you all know the standard confidentiality and integrity notions as in CCA or in ctext. This does not cater for ciphertext fragmentation. But in the framework of BDPS, you can define even stronger confidentiality and integrity notions. You can also define more elaborate notions, and I will uh, talk about two here. The first one is boundary hiding. So let's assume that Alice encrypts two, two plain texts and gets a cybertext C and a cybertext C prime. There, there. And she now sends these two cybertexts to Bob. What E will see in the network is just a long string of bytes. The boundary hiding notion BHSFCSA uh, formalizes Eve's ability to tell which part of this ciphertext of this long string of bytes is C and which part is C prime. Protocols such as SSH tries to achieve boundary hiding by, for example, encrypting a length field 
we're having an option of adding a random amount of padding. The second notion is a notion that captures a class of denial of service attacks. And this is best explained by an example. So this diagram up here is a cryptographic processing of an OpenSSH packet using an encrypt then mic cipher mode. Using such a cipher mode, you cannot encrypt the link field. But this leaves an easy attack for Eve. Eve simply flips a bit, a certain bit in a, in a packet link field, which makes it indicate for the receiver that the packet is way larger than, it's, than it actually is. This means that the receiver will wait or stall until it received a lot, a lot of bytes, a kind of denial of service. So you can define a notion in DOS SFCF8 that captures this kind of denial of service like attacks. The N, or the notion is parameterized by, by an N that indicates the largest ciphertext that Eve can produce that is not detected uh, as a denial of service. And to have a sensible security uh, gain, this N needs to be smaller than the maximum packet size often imposed by implementations. Hello. There you go. Boom. So it's these four notions that we want to consider uh, in the BDPS framework. And it's these notions uh, that we believe that some extra encryption schemes should satisfy for be considered for a practical deployment. The two right-hand notions were defined by BDPS. They also defined the confidentiality notion, but a technical flaw was later uh, fixed by Albrecht, Degabelli, myself, and Patterson in 2016. And we also introduced an integrity notion. So the question is now whether there exists a scheme that meets all these security notions simultaneously. And such a scheme exists, and it's called Intermac. And it's constructed in the following way. For so giving a message, first split the message into equal sized chunks of size n minus 1, where we count in bytes. Then encode each chunk with a byte 0, except for the last chunk, which is in being encoded with a byte 1. Then encrypt each chunk that gives a ciphertext, and then compute a MAC over each ciphertext, where we, where we also include a chunk and message counter. The chunk counter is incremented for each chunk and resets, and, and is being reset for each, each new message, and the message counter is uh, incremented for each, each message. Then concatenate all the the chunk ciphertext and MAC text to produce the final ciphertext. Decrypting is, is done chunk-wise and in an on online manner. So when a receiver has received this first part, goes ahead checking the MAC or verifying the MAC, then decrypting, and then inspecting the last byte. If the last byte is a 1, we have recovered the original plain text. This was presented by BDPS. And as I said, it achieves all four security notions simultaneously. I won't bore you with the proof, but it sort of goes a bit of intuition, but the intuition is pretty simple. For setting for boundary hiding, if the encryption scheme is in dollar CPA, this means that it produces random looking ciphertext, and the MAC acts as a PRF, it should somehow be that these individual parts here looks random, and then the, the whole thing also looks random. And we can also note that we have denial of, of service security for each time we meet one of these MACs. All right. So the rest of the time I will spend on talking about how we implemented this scheme and, and we tested the security. Oh, sorry. And we measured its performance. But before implementing, we need to, we need to fix a limitation in the scheme. Because right now, the scheme only encrypts messages that are a multiple of n minus 1. It's pretty simple to fix, we just add some padding. 
and this, the pattern we apply is the following. If the last byte of the message is zero, we add ones. If the last byte is not zero, we just add zeros. So pretty simple. To avoid having to add padding, even though the message is a, is a multiple of n minus one, we modify the encoding of the last chunk to indicate whether we need padding or not. We also do some kind of syntactic change and remove the encrypted MAC and introduce non-spaced AE schemes. When doing this change, you need to be conscious about correctly integrating or, or adding in the chunk and message counter and also generating the nonce correctly. So given these modifications, we implemented uh, Intermac and created Intermac lib. So Intermac lib is a C implementation, and the overall aim was to make it safe to use. So safe to use is kind of a vague term, but we use it to mean that it should be very easy to use for a developer, and it should be hard for them to make any mistakes. So we have a very small API that, that's simply just where you can just initialize an instance of, of Intermac lib, where you can encrypt or decrypt, and that's it. We also implemented complete nonce management, so a user cannot even input an, a nonce or cannot modify any nonces at all. We also have a feature of algorithm uh, agility, which means that if you want to use a specific non-spaced AE scheme as an internal encryption function, you can implement that. And right now, we support ASTCM and Chachapulli as the internal AE schemes. Right. So let's look more closely at how we manage nonces. So when initializing an Intermac lib instance, the first thing a user must do, or one of the things he must do, uh, is to choose a non-spaced AE scheme to use. This, this affects the way the nonces are handled. During initialization, we also initialize the chunk and message counters to zero. And we use the chunk and message counters to generate a nonce. So the first part of the nonce is the 32 least significant bits of the chunk counter. And the second part is the 64 least significant bits of the message counter. And clearly, if the chunk counter and message counter are uh, updated, as I described earlier, the nonce will, will be different for every time you use it. Okay, so how do we do nonces when Intermag is using Chachapulli? The Chachapulli AE construction closely follows our C7539. And this construction needs a nonce that is uh, 69, oh, sorry, 96 bits long. That's the exact nonce we just created, so we can directly use that. Also note that a block counter here has nothing to do at all with, with Intermac. It's something that is used internally in a charger function. However, you, you must be certain, you, uh, you must be very careful of updating it correctly, otherwise you lose all security. Okay, so how do we do nonces when Intermac is using ASTCM? It's pretty simple. We just initialize ASTCM with the nonce for each chunk. This can maybe be pretty, pretty costly, but uh, Intermac uses OpenSSL to, uh, to provide ASTCM support, and we haven't really found a way to, to avoid this per chunk initialization. All right. So now we have a library that uh, implements Intermac. Uh, and we have a library that uses different internal non-space schemes. So we took the library and we implemented Intermac-based uh, cipher modes in OpenSSH. And the reason for choosing OpenSSH is that we believe that by the their, their design of the protocol actually wants the security notions I uh, I presented before. <coughs> well, currently, none of the cipher modes actually satisfies them. At least not all of them simultaneously. So we implemented some for them. And we implemented Intermac 
uh, based cipher modes using both the AES GCM internal AE scheme and the Chacha Poly internal AE scheme. So from now on, instead of saying intermac based cipher modes, I'll just refer to them as IM modes. Uh, and then here, the N indicates the, the chunk length. And unfortunately, you cannot dynamically negotiate uh, the internal non space scheme or the chunk length when, when you do the handshake in SSH. So instead, you need to hard code these into the, into the, the code. There's two remarks I want to make about the, the implementation of these uh, cipher modes. The first one is that when you use Intermac, uh, actually the majority of the fields in the SSH package becomes redundant. So maybe controversial, we, we removed these um, to save a bit of overhead. The second remark is that we implement a standalone code path, code path for Intermac when it's being processed. Uh, and it's doing this cryptographic processing. And the reason for that is that the, the packet processing in OpenSSH is quite complex and historically pretty buggy. And if you don't believe me, you can read this paper, or this one, or this one. And that's probably so, there's several more. Um, also, processing using Intermag is quite a lot simpler than the normal, uh, for, the, and then for the normal cipher modes. All right, so now we have some Intermac-based cipher modes. Now we want to see how they perform against existing modes. So we ran a test where we measured some the throughput. We measured how many bytes it's actually transmitted uh, during the test, and we saw and we investigated how this relates to the chunk length parameter. And so a bit of methodology. So we wanted a somewhat realistic network setting. So we spun up uh, an AWS instance in London and one in the uh, US. And we used a, uh, SCP to transfer a 100 megabyte file from London to US. And the first metric we looked at was how fast the cyber modes were to transfer this file, or how much data that could send per second. The first thing I went into your attention is the Okay, you cannot see the rest of the one, but whatever. Uh, so the first half mode I bring to your attention is the, it's the bottom one here, which is AES encounter mode using HMAT and 5 as the MAC. And this boots uh, a speed of approximately four and a half megabytes per second. And this compares pretty well to the best performing Intermac uh, IM cipher mode, which is using AES TCM and then with a chunk, le chunk length of 512. So the choice of this cipher mode might seem odd, but it's actually the most preferred cipher mode by OpenSSH servers on the internet, as we measured in 2016. And it's actually preferred by almost 60% of all OpenSSH servers. So our Intermic cipher mode performs pretty well compared to this very popular cipher mode. The best performing uh, cipher mode was the pure AES TCM, which already existed in OpenSSH. But as you can see, the other IM cipher modes with ASCCM actually performs somewhat OK compared to that. There's some different, there's a funny distribution in the performance, though. <coughs> if you look at the chunk length, or the mode with the chunk length 428, and 512, and maybe 4096, it seems to relate to the chunk length. And this behavior is probably best described with the next chart, which shows how many bytes of ciphertext is sent when we did this 100 megabyte uh, transfer. So for the existing modes, there's quite a uniform amount of ciphertext being sent. <coughs> the story is very different for the IM modes. And the reason for this is the padding that we needed to apply and to make the scheme usable in practice, or to allow arbitrary length encryptions. So the padding, the padding combined with the extra MAC tags you need to include, and the encoding, actually means that we will send approximately between 10 and 30, 35% more ciphertext compared to the existing schemes. <coughs> oh. 
But the conclusion here is still that <coughs> for this 100 megabyte file transfer, the IAM mode still performed relatively well compared to the existing modes, but with a non-negligible expansion in the, in the amount of ciphertext. Even though the IAM schemes actually use or had to apply more encryption, so have to do more macking. All right, almost done. <coughs> so we, I alluded you to the, the framework by BDPS, which provides a framework for studying symmetric encryption schemes that caters for, for cybertech fragmentation. And we believe that this feature of cybertech fragmentation should be reflected in the security models. We then modified Intermac, which satisfies all the desired security notions simultaneously, and we implemented it and created Intermac Lib. We then used our Intermac Lib to implement uh, IAM-based uh, cipher modes in OpenSSH, because we believe by, this, by its protocol design that it wants cipher modes that achieves uh, the security notions. And our testing shows that you can achieve greater security by trading only a minor, minor uh, amount of performance. And furthermore, we believe that Intermag is the SSH packet protocol done right. All right. Just to end with a bit of optimism, thank you for your attention. And questions? Thanks for your talk. So the 10 to 35% overhead is significant. Yep. I wonder how much of that is caused by the SCP application layer <laughs> writing data not in the right multiple, and if you can fix that by having your library delay the actual encryption for a little bit to see if more data comes in. That's a good, yeah, good point. So the way you achieve the least amount of padding is when SCP the data segment served by SCP to an underlying packet processing aligns well with the chunk length. That's right. But, yeah, so this is a good example of when we design crypto, we should also consider what the application is actually doing and maybe also what the network conf configurations are. Right. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, along those lines, did you measure the performance impact for interactive sessions where I'm just typing single byte characters? So I actually forgot to mention, these are only we're a very small amount of tests, and we plan to do more comprehensive tests, and one of them is definitely to do the session-based one, where we hope to show that you can achieve greater security by an negligible amount of performance hits that is not observable by, by a user. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay, let's thank the speaker again.